I'm Chuck Reese, editor of SalvationSouth.com and host of the Salvation South podcast from Georgia Public Broadcasting. This is the second of a special two-part episode where we look back on our most popular commentaries aired by GPB Radio in 2023. In these commentaries, I often talk about how cultures from around the world have integrated themselves into the culture of the American South. Now, in this commentary from June, I look at a truly unique and harmonious marriage of bluegrass picking with the music of China, direct from Nashville, of course. I talk about the culture of the American South here every Friday, And if you listen regularly, you know there is a drum I beat consistently. I just love how absorptive Southern culture is, how it takes in new influences and changes as new people make this place their home. Now, centuries ago, Southern music absorbed one of its many undeserved gifts, an African instrument called the banjo. And that instrument became part and parcel of the music we know as bluegrass like this. That's Foggy Mountain Breakdown by the legendary North Carolina picker Earl Scruggs. Now keep that melody in your mind for a minute while we fast forward to the 21st century. A few decades ago, a little girl named Wu Fei became a musical prodigy in her home city of Beijing, China. The instrument she played was the guzheng, That's G-U-H-Z-E-N-G. The guzheng is 2,000 years old, and it is plucked, just like a banjo. But where the banjo typically has five strings, the guzheng has either 21, 25, or 26 strings, and it is 5 feet 4 inches long. Wu Fei first studied in Beijing at the China Conservatory of Music, learning the very strict repertoire of Chinese classical. In 2002, when she was 25, she came to America to study music at Mills College in California. Thirteen years later, she settled with her husband and children in Nashville, Tennessee, where she met a modern-day banjo virtuoso named Abigail Washburn. As fate would have it, Washburn had lived in China for a while after college and had become fluent in Mandarin. So these two string-plucking women began to make music together, and in 2020 they released an album. Now, I could try to describe it, but it's better that you listen to a few seconds of it. Now that song has a wonderful title, Banjo Guzhang Pickin' Girls. And every Southerner I know would say that music sounds awfully familiar. It's basically bluegrass, but with the extra magic of 26 more strings, you might even call it the Everest Mountain Breakdown. Rob Russian Knopf, who writes about music for Salvation South, the online magazine I edit, first told me about Wu and her music, and I've been just delighted to listen to it and publish Rob's story about her. And I think Wu Fei is a shining example of the fact that Southern culture can be as absorptive as a good sponge. When we are at our best, our culture can welcome anyone from anywhere as long as they bring their talents and their heart. Come read more about and listen to more from Wu Fei at SalvationSouth.com. That was Chinese Bluegrass from June 2023. Let me ask you something. How well do you remember what you were like when you were only eight years old? Most of us would never dream of doing the things as adults that we did when we were kids. But have you ever wondered whether thinking like an eight-year-old could actually be a great thing? Here's a commentary from back in March. Being eight was great. I was reminded of that a couple of months ago when a submission came into Salvation South, the magazine I edit. 
It was from someone I had gone to high school with in Ella J, Georgia. Her name was Cindy Green. And when I saw the submission, I wasn't at all sure it was the same Cindy I went to school with because she spelled her last name with an E at the end, and the submission had no E. But it actually was my friend from high school. Turns out she had married a man named Mike Green, whose name had no E at the end, which made my friend's proper married name, check it out, Cindy Green Green. That doesn't matter. What matters is that Cindy had sent me the kind of story I rarely get. Stories of childhood memories pop up in our submissions frequently, but they're not usually happy memories, and they rarely go all the way back to age eight. Cindy's story for us was focused on an enormous maple tree in the front yard of the house where she grew up. School was out, she wrote, and Carefree was my middle name. She recalled sitting on the front steps, wondering what to do with her day. That, she wrote, was when a brilliant idea came to my eight-year-old self. I would climb the tree and then change my clothes. Well, at least my shirt, so as not to fall and break my neck, without a single passerby ever being the wiser. Only an eight-year-old would think of a trick like that. As adults, we mostly think about things we could do that might attract the attention of other people. We want to be lauded for our achievements. But when we were eight and Carefree was our middle name, we wondered, what could I do today that nobody but me will ever know about? Imagine what might happen if all of us got up tomorrow thinking about doing something good that nobody but us would ever know about. Maybe load up some groceries and drop them at the community food bank. Maybe drop a few bucks into the cup held by the fella holding a sign that says, Homeless Vet. Cindy finished her story this way. To this day, I see the springtime maples as so much more than splendid shade trees to carry us through the heat of summer. I feel the joy of my imagination, like the warmth of the sunshine falling on my face. I see my front porch steps, and I yearn for the simplicity of my eight-year-old existence. I'm glad I grew up with someone like her. You can read Cindy's full story at SalvationSouth.com. That was recapturing our carefree childhood for March 2023. We're looking back at some of our favorite Salvation South commentaries aired by Georgia Public Broadcasting this year. When I was 19, I encountered what many people say is the greatest Southern novel ever written, William Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. Now, the book is a grueling test for even the most dedicated reader but in this commentary from July, I'll explain why it's still worth your time. I first read Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner in a sophomore Southern Lit class. My professor said it was the great Southern novel, but at first, it bamboozled me. The opening sentence is 122 words long with nary a comma. Let me read it to you. From a little after two o'clock until almost sundown of the long, still, hot, weary, dead September afternoon, they sat in what Miss Colefield still called the office because her father had called it that, a dim, hot, airless room with the blinds all closed and fastened for 43 summers. No, I won't make you listen to the whole thing. You can and should read it for yourself. Now, Miss Rosa Coldfield, the old lady in that hot, weary, dead room, is talking to a young Mississippian named Quentin Thompson, who will soon depart for Massachusetts and Harvard University. 
She hopes Quentin will someday write the story of her violent brother-in-law, a man she hated, a man she called a demon. And his is a story of an antebellum South that Quentin was, in Miss Coalfield's words, fortunate enough to escape. When Quentin arrives at Harvard, he tells this tale of the twisted old South to his roommate Shreve, who is from Canada. And on page 174, Shreve says to Quentin something that captures the very essence of every Southerner's reckoning with our region's dark past. Tell about the South. What's it like there? What do they do there? Why do they live there? Why do they live at all? Arguably, that is the same question all Southern writers, maybe even just Southerners in general, have asked themselves for more than a century. Now, I can't explain in the short time I have here why I believe every Southerner should read Absalom, Absalom. I'll just say that I've spent many years reading and studying stories from and about the South, and I still, even four decades later, have never read a book that dives so unflinchingly into the dark heart of this region's unrighteous history. Absalom, Absalom, if you have never read it, will certainly test your patience, but it'll reward it too. And you can always read a bunch of Southern stories at SalvationSouth.com. That was my take on Absalom, Absalom, which is a challenging but absolutely essential read for every Southerner. Back in spring, as we were celebrating Mother's Day, many of us were thinking about the ones who brought us into this world. In this commentary from May, I talked about how I had been thinking about my own mother, who left me too early, but remains with me still. On Sunday, we will celebrate Mother's Day. And I've been thinking about Mama, both the word itself and the person it represents. Now, the Mama we think about when we think about all the women who gave birth to and raised children is an icon, a totem, a symbol. She is our best friend, our confidant, our protector, our guiding light. And for many adults who will actually have the privilege this weekend of celebrating Mother's Day with their living mothers, they will see their mamas in that beautiful light sitting right there across the dinner table from them. But there are also many of us who never knew our mamas at all or who lost them far too early, as I did. Flora Louise Smith Reese died two months after I celebrated my 11th birthday. I do remember her as my friend, confidant, and protector. But I also remember the gap, those years of my youth when her presence lived only in the memories of my father, my aunts, my uncles, and my cousins. Now, I've been thinking about my mama a lot lately. Yes, because Mother's Day is coming, but also because of other reasons. A few weeks ago, I interviewed one of my favorite songwriters, Iris Dement, who grew up singing church songs with her parents, just like I did. And there are more parallels between my life and Iris's. First, we were born only five days apart. Second, her mother was named Flora too. On Iris' first album, which came out in 1992, the last song was an old hymn called Higher Ground, which she sang in a duet with her own mother, Flora. No voice has inspired me more than my mother's. She showed me that music is a pathway to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stay. 20 years before that album came out, Higher Ground was one of the last songs I heard my own mother, Flora, sing in church. I kind of lost it when I first heard that duet, 
and I usually still do most every time I've played it since. Talking to Iris reminded me of that duet and the memory that it conjured the first time I heard it. Flora Reese, my best friend and guiding light, standing in the choir of Pleasant Valley Church and singing that song like an angel. We hope y'all have a happy Mother's Day, either with the woman herself or your memories of her. And come visit us at SalvationSouth.com where we have collected our best writing about Mama to help you celebrate. That was Mother's Day and memories of my mama, Flora Reese, from May 2023. We've come to the final commentary on our year-end Salvation South retrospective. It's from all the way back in January, and it's one of the most important ones we did all year. We aired it right before we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the national holiday that honors the late Atlanta civil rights leader, theologian, and American icon. During his career, Dr. King spoke and wrote often about what he called the beloved community. In this commentary, I considered what King meant when he talked about that. My wife Stacy and I founded Salvation South, the online magazine I edit, a little over a year ago. In describing our purpose, I wrote this. Salvation South is a publication for people who believe that our region, the American South, actually could become the beloved community envisioned by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. On Monday, all of us will celebrate MLK Day, the holiday that honors the life of Dr. King, So I thought I should spend a little time reflecting on that idea of a beloved community that the late great teacher talked and wrote about so often. At a 1956 victory rally to celebrate the end of segregation on public buses, King talked about why nonviolent actions like boycotts were the best way African Americans could achieve the civil and voting rights that they sought. The end of nonviolent action, King said, is, and I quote, reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. It is this type of understanding goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men. When Dr. King talked about the beloved community, he was talking about a society governed not by violence or conflict, but by love. A year later in 1957, he wrote these words for Ebony Magazine. Love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy, but it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, love, which means understanding, creative and redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies is the solution to the race problem. Now, it seems to me that his philosophy was far greater than just, as he said, the solution to the race problem. It's a philosophy that could solve a host of problems we face today and will face in the future. What Dr. King was asking us to do was simple. He was asking us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. He was asking us to look beyond conflict and doubt and misgivings in the hope of trying to understand each other. These are big ideas, inspiring ideas. And I think every Georgian could benefit by taking a little time to reflect on them 
over this holiday weekend. Come visit us at SalvationSouth.com. That concludes our year-end Salvation South commentary retrospective. We've got a lot of great things planned for next year, including monthly installments of a new thing called Salvation South Deluxe, a series of longer episodes that will tell deeper stories of the Southern experience through the unique voices of the people who live it. Be sure to listen and subscribe to Salvation South at gpb.org slash podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, do come visit us at salvationsouth.com. I'm Chuck Reese. I appreciate you listening.